So in this session, we're going to be looking at the concept of deep learning. Now, we're also going to be exploring classification systems that utilize deep learning, um, the neural networks that form the basis of such processes, and how we can apply this to adaptive learning systems. And then we'll round off by looking at a concept called bias, which is one of the constraints that we currently have around the use of deep learning um, for various industries and processes, including education. So what is deep learning? It's a form of machine learning where we utilize computers to um, examine patterns in data and make decisions about a range of different aspects of that data. But the defining characteristic of deep learning is that it builds a model based upon what we call hidden layers. Um, so it's making links between associated concepts and the strengths of those links determine the weighting placed upon particular pathways through what we call a neural network. We're going to explore this in a little bit more detail as we go through this session. But this is what it represents graphically. Now, it's how our brain works. We have lots and lots of interconnected neurons, billions of them, and they all form this vast network inside our brain. And each of them represents some sort of um, concept, or element, or image, uh, sound, and how they all interrelate forms our thought processes, our memories, our understandings, our computational processes. And computers can use a similar system, um, very much simplified, at least at the moment, nowhere near as complex as the human brain uses its um, neural network. But even with very simple neural networks, we are able to mimic how the brain makes decisions. So let's have a look at a little video clip on what is deep learning. Ever wondered how Google translates an entire web page to a different language in a matter of seconds? Or your phone gallery groups images based on their location? All of this is a product of deep learning. But what exactly is deep learning? Deep learning is a subset of machine learning, which in turn is a subset of artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is a technique that enables a machine to mimic human behavior. Machine learning is a technique to achieve AI through algorithms trained with data. And finally, deep learning is a type of machine learning inspired by the structure of the human brain. In terms of deep learning, this structure is called an artificial neural network. Let's understand deep learning better and how it's different from machine learning. Say we create a machine that could differentiate between tomatoes and cherries. If done using machine learning, we'd have to tell the machine the features based on which the two can be differentiated. These features could be the size and the type of stem on them. With deep learning, on the other hand, the features are picked out by the neural network without human intervention. Of course, that kind of independence comes at the cost of having a much higher volume of data to train our machine. Now, let's dive into the working of neural networks. Here, we have three students. Each of them write down the digit nine on a piece of paper. Notably, they don't all write it identically. The human brain can easily recognize the digits. But what if a computer had to recognize them? That's where deep learning comes in. Here's a neural network trained to identify handwritten digits. Each number is present as an image of 28 times 28 pixels. Now, that amounts to a total of 784 pixels. Neurons, the core entity of a neural network, is where the information processing takes place. Each of the 784 pixels is fed to a neuron in the first layer of our neural network. This forms the input layer. On the other end, we have the output layer with each neuron representing a digit with the hidden layers existing between them. The information is transferred from one layer to another over connecting channels. Each of these has a value attached to it and hence is called a weighted channel. All neurons have a unique number associated with it called bias. 
This bias is added to the weighted sum of inputs reaching the neuron, which is then applied to a function known as the activation function. The result of the activation function determines if the neuron gets activated. Every activated neuron passes on information to the following layers. This continues up till the second last layer. The one neuron activated in the output layer corresponds to the input digit. The weights and bias are continuously adjusted to produce a well-trained network. So, where is deep learning applied? In customer support. When most people converse with customer support agents, the conversation seems so real. They don't even realize that it's actually a bot on the other side. In medical care, neural networks detect cancer cells and analyze MRI images to give detailed results. Self-driving car. What seemed like science fiction is now a reality. Apple, Tesla, and Nissan are only a few of the companies working on self-driving cars. So, deep learning has a vast scope, but it too faces some limitations. The first, as we discussed earlier, is data. While deep learning is the most efficient way to deal with unstructured data, a neural network requires a massive volume of data to train. Let's assume we always have access to the necessary amount of data. Processing this is not within the capability of every machine. And that brings us to our second limitation, computational power. Training a neural network requires graphical processing units, which have thousands of cores as compared to CPUs. And GPUs are, of course, more expensive. And finally, we come down to training time. Deep neural networks take out so that gives us a bit of an overview of um, neural networks and deep learning processes. And one of the uses we use these systems for is classification. Now humans are very good at classifying. Um, in the 17th to 19th centuries, most of science was devoted almost its entirety to classification of animals, plants, um, ge geological features, we spent a huge amount of time classifying and it allowed us to understand that different things have got different properties and those properties help define what they are. And then as we understood biology and physics and things like that more, we could then understand why that was expressed in those different properties. But initially it was all about the properties, what made something similar to something else. And artificial neural networks are also very useful in classification. Now we're going to explore a couple of classification systems um, using a tool called UClassify. So let's have a look here. Now on the UClassify website you'll find a whole range of classification systems that can be used to determine various um, solutions to problems or answers to different questions. But the one we're going to look at is uh, Agenda Analyzer. So this allows us to put in some text. Um, uh, let's see. So put in a little bit of Shakespearean text and we can then classify that. And the system ideally should tell us if it is a male or female. And here, as has been debated many times by a number of academics, unsure of the gender of Shakespeare, um, this system tells us that from that snippet of text, it's more likely to have been a male than a female. Now, how it determines that is that it's been fed lots and lots of snippets of text which have been identified as either being male or female. And the system has then been trained and using those neural networks, various weights and, and so forth have been assigned to various keywords and phrases. And it allows us then to make a determination as to, in this case, whether something is male or female. And on the website, you'll find a whole range of other um, classification um, examples which you can explore and classify um, different elements. 
So what can we do with this then? First off, in your exploration, try to give some examples of something that you've um, classified and share that onto Teams, particularly in terms of its accuracy. Did it actually provide an accurate um, classification based upon what you were expecting? So this all works using neural networks. And now we're going to actually train our own model using a tool called Cognomates. Now, this particular tool is a little more complicated. Just need to get to it. So with this tool, what you're going to do is you're going to train um, the tool around a particular model. Okay. So this is what the tool will look like. Um, let me just bring it up for you. So when you first come into the tool, you'll need to give your project a name. Now the example I'm going to go through and show you is one that is going to determine um, students' grades based upon their report card comments. Now, then you need to get what are called um, API keys. Now, sounds very complicated. It's a very simple process. Simply click down on uh, sign up and get the keys. And it will take you to a web page. You do need to register just to get the keys. It will then provide you with a read and a write key. You then take those keys, copy and paste them back to Cognomates, whoops, um, and put them into the web page here. Um, press the button, and that will then allow you to activate the neural network. Then you need to put in some keywords. So in this case, I've chosen an A student, and I'm going to put in a range of words that I would find on a student report card or parent teacher interview comments about an A student. So you could look back over your database of report card comments um, and you can even put in the whole comments but I'm just choosing a few key words here. Of course it tends to be a bit more accurate than putting in comments for this tool. Then I would have a C student and I would look at all the comments that are typical for a C student, and I would put those in. Now, some of them can be the same. There can be overlap with the A students. So it doesn't have to be perfectly separate. That's the advantage of neural networks in that we can have um, uncertain data and still make re relatively accurate um, decisions based upon that uncertain data. Because it's not matching exactly the words. It's matching a whole range of things that then allow us to um, classify based upon the data that we've been able to train in the model. So once those two sets of words have been put in, you could also put in for B students and D students and E students. Then you could put in a normal phrase. In this case, um, just a phrase that we, we might find typical for an A student. You could click on then, well, so first you need to train your model. Click on train. It will then build the neural network model work out all the weights for all those different words. Um, you then put in a question and ask it to make a prediction. And it will then tell you whether or not that is more likely to be an A student or a B student or a C student or a D student and so forth. And that essentially is how uh, machine learning works in the various systems that we see. So, 
with the Cognomates tool, we can use it for a whole range of things. Um, you could put in various quotes from all of your favorite books and movies into a system and train it with the correct um, answers. And then sometime into the future, you can think, oh, what was the what was the movie that was related to that quote? You could put in your quote and it would tell you what the movie was most likely. Likewise, we can do it for determining grades, but it can now be thought through in more com complex problems where we could say put in students essays. And if we've trained thousands and thousands of essays and said these essays are A's, these essays are B's, these essays are C's, we can then put in any student essay and it will make a determination as to what the most likely grade should be applied. And if our training has been effective and we've had enough examples on which to train the model, it can be more accurate than human markets. And that's what's currently facing um, education at the moment, where we're now able to um, have automated marking systems that are at least as, if not more accurate than trained professional human markers. But it doesn't just have to be text. We can train anything that we've got data on. So for example, a set of images, we could have a set of images of cats and a set of images of dogs. We could tell it that these are cats, these are dogs, train our model and then show it any picture. And it will make a determination as to whether that picture is more likely to be a cat or more likely to be a dog. Now, if we show it a guinea pig, it will make determinations based upon the characteristics it has towards being a cat and characteristics it has being towards a dog. And it will say whether or not is it a dog or is it a cat. It can't then say it's a guinea pig because it hasn't been trained to identify guinea pigs. But it is quite accurate for images of cats and quite accurate for images of dogs, even with relatively small numbers of, numbers of images. Um, you put in 10 images of cats and 10 images of dogs, train it, and it will be accurate most of the time. Of course, there are some cats that look very like dogs and some dogs that look very much like cats and can get confused in those situations. But for many purposes, it is accurate enough. So what can we use this for in learning? Now, the big area is around adaptive learning. We've talked a little bit about that. But the idea of being able to match individual students' needs by firstly training a model so that it understands the student, um, so it can be individualized for that student. And then we can then apply also a whole range of different um, aspects of education, such as automated marking or individualized assistance, or looking at students in terms of their potential for dropping out or failing. Um, so there can be a whole lot of aspects that we can train a system on. Let's say student attendance. We could look at all the students that have regularly attended and all of those that are more uh, um, have truanted, look at all the characteristics of them, put that in it in terms of data, and then train the model. And then we get a new student, we say, okay, they're 60% likely to truant um, on a particular certain day. Um, and then we could make sure we go and encourage them more or um, do some sort of intervention based upon the data and the model that we've trained on. So there can be a whole range of applications that we can have as long as we have the data and we can train against various possible responses. So think of an example where we could apply adaptive learning in your own context and share that again onto Teams. So, whoops, let's look again at some of the educational applications. The complexities that exist now with teaching are indescribable. Technology issues happen all of the time. Today in the educational system, there's been an exponential increase in the amount of bandwidth available. Going forward, the amount of capacity that a student may consume is really unknown. The education industry has been digitizing for the last decade. We are at a point in time where the world is changing very rapidly.
Educators have the ability to use more technology than ever before in their classrooms, whether the classrooms are physical classrooms or the distributed classrooms. But the way that teachers connect to the students are more and more network dependent. Because students are in different places, teachers have been required to think differently about how they reach students. Adaptive learning. Adaptive learning. Adaptive learning is this idea that you can personalize instruction to every student. And that shift is allowing teachers to become facilitators of that learning experience. One of the reactions to this has been to bring more technology into education, but this brings with it its own issues. In an average day, teachers switch between multiple applications, 10, 15, 20 applications. They're also suddenly having to switch between multiple devices. Tablets, laptops, computers, PCs. Just having all this technology in the classroom really doesn't accomplish much unless you've got it connected to the cloud. Teachers are excited about technology. However, they become frustrated when technology does not work. If the network fails, we fail to educate. That's clearly unacceptable. We're at a point in time where we have to meet the demand for learning and on-the-go access to information that this generation expects. One of the key things that has to be done to fix the educational system going forward is the network. And the network can't be just a big static network. It all depends on having that network be adaptive to the demands placed on it. Personalized adaptive learning can only happen if students have access to technology and then access to high-speed internet. It's a story of abundance of connections and capacity right down to the student's desk, whether they're in the classroom or at home, but getting them the capability to learn with whatever tools are available. Teachers are thinking about how can we enable technology to help educators focus more deeply on the learning experience. Video conferencing, moving that up in just in terms of resolution, adding in artificial intelligence, being able to do pattern recognition, being able to look at how a student interacts with things and how they learn. Augmented reality, virtual reality, those are all gonna play a role in future education. In a future with personalized adaptive learning, not only are students working closely with their personalized voice assistants, but they're also working with human teachers to deliver the best in pedagogy and the best in learning experiences to students anytime, anywhere. Teachers and students will be curators and creators of things that are unimaginable to us today. That is extremely exciting. And that kind of a world really can be created if we put the infrastructure in place, the massive consumption of images and information that's necessary to put together those experiences. That requires lots of network capacity, lots of network connectivity, and it really requires the networks to be adaptive in real time. We view the adaptive network as being critical to making adaptive learning widespread. So these tools are in development and we're seeing more and more of them every year. Um, this is an example of one that is Your test is in a week used for and you haven't AI started studying yet. And worse, you're not sure how to study or what to focus on. That's why we built Quizlet Learn. When we started, we used machine learning to analyze millions of anonymous study sessions. Then, we combined that data with proven techniques from cognitive science on the best ways to study and retain information. Now, when you need to study, tell us what materials you need to master and when you need to know them by. Quizlet Learn uses that information to build you an adaptive study plan. As you study, it recognizes patterns and adjusts the questions you see to be easier or harder. Quizlet Learn also updates you on your progress to help you stay motivated and sends you study reminders to keep you on track. When you hit 100%, you know you're ready for an in-class review, a big exam, or whatever else school throws your way. Learn is available on the Quizlet app. Download it for free today. Such as another example of AI applications being brought into the classroom. And probably the most significant aspect of 
adaptive learning and certainly adaptive testing is in our Australian National um, Assessment Program, our NAPLAN tests, where they are now being conducted online and using various adaptive technologies to adjust which questions are presented to different students. Robots will soon be marking students' NAPLAN tests. Teachers are nervous about the rise of the bots and a US expert says they have good reason to be. Students are already completing their NAPLAN tests on computer. Now machines will mark them too. Computer marking is as reliable and valid as human marking. The Australian Curriculum and Assessment Authority has been busily tweaking its artificial intelligence. We use humans to train the computer, and the computer then is able to simulate the types of decisions that the human markers make. Now, there is no automatic transition to automated marking. This is something we are testing, we are assessing. No machine has the capacity to assess creative flair, imaginative use of language, humour, irony. Now a US expert has weighed in. Retired MIT professor Les Perelman was commissioned by the teachers union to examine the evidence. He's urging extreme caution. What the computer markers reward are wordiness, pretentious diction, big words, uh, lots of commas, believe it or not. The more commas, the better. In what Akara says is an irrelevant experiment, Dr. Perelman used an automated scorer to test an essay by celebrated linguist Noam Chomsky. He found 45 grammatical errors. And he emailed me back saying that he knew he couldn't get into college these days. All NAPLAN tests will be double marked next year by computer and a human. Those in charge say that will show machines are quite capable of doing the job on their own. Natasha Robinson, ABC News. And that's the point where we're at, where we now have systems in place that are demonstrating the ability to achieve comparable results to human markers. Now, it doesn't mean that they don't still make mistakes. Machine learning and deep learning systems, by their nature, make mistakes. They make predictions based upon the data available and the best guess as to the most appropriate response. But they are relatively consistent. And that's one advantage they have over human markers who also make mistakes. Um, and it's really a matter of who makes the most mistakes and um, which is most useful in terms of consistency and being able to improve upon the accuracy of those systems. And at the moment, the machine marking systems are proving to be more effective. Now, it's not to say they don't still have problems, um, particularly around aspects that are outside the norm. Um, they're very good at normative systems whereby the mass of data indicates something. It's the outliers that cause problems, where someone does something really incredible but not many other people have ever done that. So the system hasn't been trained to respond to that exception. Um, but the advantage of these systems is that they can be improved upon, just as we're seeing with automated driving. Initially, automated driving will work fantastic in well-known circumstances on, on well-established highways, with clearly marked situations and so forth. One of the big problems they had initially with automated driving was they brought it to Australia and they had all of these systems in place that were trained in the United States and in Europe. So when it saw a cow on the side of the road, it would respond in different ways. Um, of course, cows tended to respond in certain predictable patterns. They had it in Australia and suddenly it detected a kangaroo and unfortunately in Australia, kangaroos don't behave in predictable patterns like cows do. They will often jump straight out into the middle of the road for no real reason at all. And so the system had to be trained to accommodate that exceptional circumstance so that it could now understand as best it could the behavior of kangaroos. Um, and likewise, 
millions upon millions of other exceptional circumstances slowly get added to these models and they get, they improve. Now that's something that can be done at scale. When you're doing it with tens of thousands of students or tens of thousands of markers, the system can improve to ex extraordinary extent over relatively short periods of time, far more than a human being can be trained to improve over the same period of time. So that's the aspect. But there is one concern around these systems, and it's a concern we've always had with human systems as well, and that is bias, where we have either intentional or unintentional bias in our decision making. So it may be we just don't like stories about science fiction. And in our marking, as we go through the marking process, we've got some students that have science fiction stories and some that have drama and historical fiction and things like that. And our inherent bias tends to grade the students that haven't done science fiction a little bit higher. Now, we can try to mitigate that. We can have rubrics and criteria and all the rest. We can have multiple markers. But that inherent bias can sometimes still occur. And it can also occur with machine learning systems. And what often happens in machine learning systems is that inherent bias is trained into the system based upon the decisions we make when we train the system. Now, there was a little computer game that I've got for you to have a look through that will show you how that inherent bias can occur. And this is a recruiting system. So, with survival of the best fit, what you'll do is, uh, let me just bring it up again. It will allow you to make decisions as a recruiter would make decisions. Oops, wrong one. Okay, uh, essentially what the system will allow you to do is you will be presented with a set of applicants for a job and it will give you the characteristics like the resume, how smart they are, how well they've done on various aptitude tests and you will be asked to make a decision as to whether or not to hire them or not. And it will take you through that process and you will make your hiring decisions and then it will point out the biases that you have made in your decision making processes and how as we train our AI systems with those biases um, the AI will then in making its decisions replicate those biases um, and obviously that's not a great thing to happen um, be that through student assessment or through various other processes that we can incorporate using machine learning. So there are some various categories of bias, uh, individual versus group fairness or both, um, and the data model being fair versus the um, group model. And there's an example here around ATAR with the Wizzy Wiggle, what you see is what you get, and the we're all equal views of bias um, as to how we apply our group fairness. Um, so you can reflect upon some of those in terms of your own bias in your own decision making and how that could be incorporated into adaptive learning or other um, automated assessment principles and various other things we could apply with machine learning. So that has been an overview of machine learning. Um, we'll discuss this further in the tutorials. And then next week, we'll go into a more specific aspect of artificial intelligence and how it can apply in terms of various applications in education.